The sheriff's obligations, mandates, and responsibilities go way beyond simple arresting, simply arresting bad guys and serving papers. Among other things, all elected officials swear an oath to support and defend our state and national constitution. Let me ask you this, when in our history did it change? That to talk about the Constitution, you were considered a radical. Where have we gone wrong? Where did, that, where did we make that wrong turn? You gotta speak up, Yucca, we can't hear you back there. Is this any better? Yeah. yeah. Is this better yet? No. I, I hate microphones. Okay. The main goal of government is what? To protect the people. We've kind of gotten away from that. Actually, my eyes were opened after I took the office of sheriff. <laughs> Only then did I realize the depth and breadth of the problem, the dilemma uh, that we face today. We live in the strongest and most privileged country in the world. Having said that, however, we no longer live in the wonderful world that I grew up in. Mm -hmm. Having lived six years in the war-torn countries of Bosnia and Kosovo, I quickly recognized the similarities between their countries and ours. Basically, the negative impact of an overreaching central or federal government and the subsequent consequences to that. One only needs to open their eyes and ears and minds to see what's coming. Loss of jobs, an economy in dire straits, questionable federal authority and jurisdiction, delving into every aspect of our daily lives, such as public lands, natural resources, jobs, revenue, production, growth, economy, food, fuel, water, air, private property, and safety, just to mention a few. What do you Was it a statement? Oh. Pretty much all of them. Huh? <laughs> well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We all know that. What we face today is, is a multi-dimensional dilemma to which there is no magic bullet. We can, however, take on one problem at a time and carefully work our way through it. And I'm so thankful for people like Ken Ivory that have done the research and gone to the limits of the lengths that they've gone to bring these issues to the forefront so that we can talk about them and we can work through them. So you guys came to hear him, and I'm going to get off the stage. And, and uh, Bill, are you introducing the next guy? Uh, actually, you, you can do that. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you come on up? I want to get his name in anyway. It's Ken Ivory. Yeah. What a man. I don't know if I can introduce uh, Representative Ken Ivory any more than, any better than Sheriff Bill Gilbert's again. I had a chance to talk with him a couple of weeks ago in the lead up to this. But uh, as you well know, he is an attorney. Or maybe you don't know he's an attorney. Are you okay with him being an attorney? Yes. Well, dealing that, uh, well, we're dealing with a nation with laws, supposedly. <laughs> supposedly, I'm kind of wondering yeah. about that myself. There are but, no uh, laws. There are no laws. The law, the law is what we say the law is, depending on the you day of the it. week, right? right. Yep. Whatever is most politically expedient. Well, still, he respects the law and is actually looking into the law. Of course, he's a, a state, uh, a congressman from uh, the great state of Utah. He has been working with the American Lands Council. He's talking about the solution, and he says the language for getting control of these lands and getting more of this prosperity returning to Jackson, Josephine, and all the rest of Southern Oregon. It's right there in our, now, Ken, is it the State Enabling Act? That's what it is? Yeah. It's, the, it's in the language. It's hiding out in plain sight. So please welcome Ken Ivory. He's going to take the away. Power went out on me. There you go. That's okay. Can you hear me if I'm just right from here? Can you in the back hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. I'd much rather, I can't talk without my hands. <laughs> my kids just, they think it's really amusing, but that's just a defect I've got. But uh, I'll try to project. If I get low, which is rare to happen, you let me know in the back, all right? And you can just move forward, too, if you need to, all right? So, what an amazing time to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> this is an amazing time to be alive. Ronald Reagan said, this is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky. We're lucky. 
not to live in pale and timid times, he said. He said, we've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something, for liberty and freedom and fairness, and I would submit property, and we'll talk about these things. And he said, these are things worth fighting for, worth devoting our lives to. So let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts, happy warriors, out to see the United country in a world of freedom. That's the blessing that we've got right now, folks, right? For some reason, you all chose to come to Earth at this time. You know, the Creator said, all right, I'm going to send the best and the brightest because it's going to be a challenge. And I think also he's going to say, all right, the pride of man is going to mess it up so badly that you're going to know that you need help to get there. Um, there's your Sunday school lesson for the day. You might get more. Just, just keep warning at the beginning. So Ken Iram, the president of the American Lands Council, Utah State Representative, the American Lands Council was formed by county commissioners throughout the western states. After I passed the bill to transfer public lands, they said, we've been playing defense for 40 years. You're going on offense. We need to go on offense or we're never going to win this game. You're never going to win the game playing on one side of the court. It's time to go on offense. So a bunch of county commissioners got together. Some of your counties are members of the American Lands Council and counties all over the West and then individuals and businesses and others because the American Lands Council is leading the charge to secure local control of land access. We do this by giving knowledge and courage to leaders to battle for the only solution big enough to fund education, better care for the environment, grow the economy locally and nationally. Now that's something we should all be able to get on board with. That's right. Republicans, Democrats, left, right, middle, in between, up and down, fund education. Now how we do that, we may differ on the policy, but we, we all know we need to educate our children. Better care for the environment instead of manage it for maximum combustion. Yeah. 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 I think we all can get on board with that. Not to burn up, I mean literally burn up hundreds of millions of animals, their habitat destroyed for generations. I think we can all get on board with that. Grow the economy so that there's jobs instead of dying communities throughout the West. I think we can all get on board with that. Now let me tell you, organizations around the, 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 the West and around the nation have done resolutions supporting the transfer of public lands as the only solution big enough, like the National Association of Counties, like the American Farm Bureau, like school districts all around states, the counties, chambers of commerce, uh, the Republican National Committee. Now, I, I want to be clear, American Lands Council does not support any candidate or any party but national organizations are getting on board. I'll show you as we go through this. South Carolina did a resolution supporting the transfer of public lands. We're working into the upcoming sessions. Folks from Texas and North Dakota and Oklahoma supporting the transfer of public lands. Why would they do that? Well, they know that they're spending tens of billions of dollars a year to subsidize us to not use our own land and our own resources yep. to educate our own children and care for our own communities we'd kind of like to invite them to stop it. And they would like to stop as well. Also, they realize there's $150 trillion in mineral value locked up in the federally controlled lands. We have the answers, but no one's coming to our rescue. We are the leaders we've been waiting for, and so thank you so much for taking time on a Saturday. I know our time is precious, but we have work to do. And so, you know, we can keep waiting around and say somebody ought to do something, but last I checked, everybody in here is somebody, right? So somebody ought to do something. We'll talk about how we get there. Um, we've got, I don't have the remote working. I'm going to shift off of here, and we'll, we'll get to cover just some basics as we get started here. We come into this. You know what Vince Lombardi used to do every year? when he would start out the new year with his world champion, Green Bay Packers. Every year, he would, the world champion, professional, Green Bay Packers would come in and Vince Lombardi would hold up a football. And he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would talk about how much it weighed and its size and its dimension. And then he would walk them out to the football field. He would say, gentlemen, this is a football field. And he would talk about the length and the width and the goalposts and the height and the width. 
And that's where he would start every year. And then they'd, then they'd go from there. You know, here's what a stance is. Here's how you block and here's how you tackle. They would go back to the fundamentals every year. So I want to take a few minutes at the beginning to talk about some fundamentals that I, that I think will help you. Because at the end of the day, you're going to make a choice. I'm going to curse you with a bunch of information. That's my job. I'm going to curse you. Isn't that nice of me? And then I'm going home. But my job is to curse you with some information. And then you're going to decide what you're going to do with it. And particularly how you're going to hire and inspire leaders. Because that's what a republic is, right? How you're going to hire and inspire leaders to battle for solutions that are big enough. Because they're there. They're there. They're clearly there. Now you've got some great leaders here today. So to continue to give them your courage and then to hire and inspire others. Now, like Ronald Reagan said, there are no easy answers, but there are simple ones. We're going to talk about some simple answers. They're not easy, but they are simple. And, and that's where we've got to mobilize and move. And my gosh, you guys, the technology that we have available to us. Could you imagine Benjamin Franklin with a Facebook page? <laughs> oh, jeez. Right? You know, I mean, they have to set type one letter at a time to do their broadsides to send them out. You all can reach 10,000 people before you get out of your pajamas in the morning. By the way, anybody tweeting? On the internet. Any tweeters? A couple. All right, so you've got to teach the rest of these Luddites. Right? I mean that affectionately, okay? you got to teach. So if you're tweeting today, hashtag transfer public lands and hashtag honor the promise. And those of you that don't know what that means, talk to your neighbors and find out. Because I'm telling you, if Benjamin were here today, he would be Facebook, he would be on Twitter, he would be on LinkedIn, he would be on Instagram and Pinterest, and he would have the most rocking YouTube channel you've ever seen. Because that's the technology we have to reach thousands and tens of thousands and millions right now. What's our excuse? Don't tell me you're too old. Benjamin Franklin, right? He was the old man of the, of the Congress. Don't tell me we're too old. That's a blessing we've been given. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something. We'll talk about more of that as we get going. But so, so basics. This is a football, okay? Let's look at some of that. This is, I don't know if you know who this is, uh, W. Edwards Deming. He's, he's almost like the patron saint of just-in-time inventory manufacturing in Japan. They actually have statues to him in Japan. Look at what he says. Every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. He's right. He's right. He's right. Do you like the results that we're getting? No. 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 Then we have to work on the system. Right. We don't work on the policies. We've got to work on the principles. <clears throat> right? That's going to be critical throughout everything we're talking about today. You can work on the leaves or you can work on the roots. You work on the leaves, those are always going to be changed and blown with the wind. We've got to work on the principles. We've got to work on the system. That's our opportunity, is to get back to that. Now, granted, it's been, you know, there's a lot of deferred maintenance and, and a lot of apathy and entropy now that, that uh, has happened in our system, right? The muscles are weakening. It's going to take work, but it's simple, right? No easy answers, but there are simple ones. So let's look at some of this. See if you can tell who said this, okay? Congress has been given the right to legislate on particular subjects, but this is not the case in the great number of other vital problems of government, such as the conduct of public utilities, and of banks, and insurance, and business, and agriculture, and education, education, and social welfare, and a dozen other important features. In these, Washington must not be encouraged to interfere. Jefferson. Who do you think said that? Jefferson. 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 I got an Adams. I got a Supreme Court. Can I? FDR. <laughs> FDR. <laughs> FDR. Do you believe that? Yeah. FDR, when he was governor, when he was governor of New York, FDR. You see, we knew that there was a line. We knew that there was a line between what was a state and what was the national government created by the states. We knew there was a line and that the states were supreme in their sphere, and the federal government was supreme in its sphere. And because we knew there was a line, the federal government operated on 3% of GDP until 1930. It's now 
plus a $2 trillion a year regulatory burden. It's important to know these principles. There was a, there was a definite line that we knew. We're going to talk about that for just a second. This is the United States Supreme Court less than two years ago. Less than two years ago. The federal government has expanded dramatically over the past two centuries. Now, that's a great understatement. But it still must show that a constitutional grant of powers authorizes each of its actions. The same does not apply to the states. Think about that. The same does not apply to the states. Because the Constitution is not the source of their power. State governments do not need constitutional authorization to act. This is the Supreme Court, guys. Our cases refer to this general power of governing possessed by the states, but not the federal government as the police power. Or as you heard your sheriff say earlier, the power to protect the health, safety, and welfare of your community is a power possessed by the states, but not the general government. You see the power in that? That's the Supreme Court less than two years ago. They continue. The framers ensure that the powers which in the ordinary course of affairs concern the lives, the liberties, and the properties of the people were held by governments more local and more accountable than a distant federal bureaucracy. Supreme Court two years ago. The independent power of the states. Let me say that again. The independent power of the states also serves as a check on the power of the federal government. By denying any one government complete jurisdiction over all the concerns of public life, federalism protects the liberty of the individual from arbitrary federal power. Supreme Court two years ago, guys. We've got to use the tools we've been given. This is the Supreme Court two years ago. The independent power of the state. What is that? That's something we should be studying very directly, and we should be hiring and inspiring our leaders to understand what the Supreme Court said two years ago. In the typical case, we look to the states to defend their prerogatives by adopting the simple expedient of not yielding. federal blandishments when they do not want to embrace the federal policies as their own. States are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they have to act like it. <laughs> this is a football, right? These are the fundamentals. Now, you won't hear that, and unfortunately, Doug and, and, and Gene or, uh, and Herman can back me up on this. What we hear all day long from our attorneys in state government is supremacy. If the federal government says it, you have to yield no matter what it is. That's not our system. That's not our system. And so we have to understand these fundamentals. So I think what the Supreme Court was saying here is... <laughs> I love that. Don't borrow the money. Yeah, grow up, right? Just don't, grow up. Don't borrow the money. It's time for a state to act like a state. Now, I understand. I'm in Utah, right? I come from a very conservative state. I've got a very conservative legislature. And Oregon is a very different place. But principles are principles. May it be harder to educate here? Yeah. But you guys are the ones that signed up for Oregon, not me. <laughs> right? You signed on for this job. You signed on for the job to hire and inspire leaders that understand who they are and what their rights, powers, and authorities are, or keep taking what you're getting. That's the choice. That's the choice. So um, we'll keep going through this, but this is all gone through in this book. I wrote a, I wrote a little. I wrote this book to myself. When I was elected, I wanted to know why. Why did they want me as a state representative to swear an oath to the U.S. Constitution? That really perplexed me. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't just to raise your hand and have a ceremony and then go out to lunch. But there was some meaning in that. So I went through. I wanted to know what they meant by the rights, powers, authorities of the states. And so this little book is over there. It's ten dollars. That just helps us keep printing them and getting more out, but that's available. And, and a lot of this information is in there. Let's kind of keep, keep reviewing just a little bit, okay? Eighth grade, this is what we learn about checks and balances, right? You've seen this before, right? Checks and balances are what? What are they? Come on, you know what they are. Executive, legislative, judicial, and, 
and that's where we usually stop, right? That's where we stop. In eighth grade civics, that's you, you've all seen a diagram of something like this before, right? Oh yeah. That's not our government. That's not our government. That's a, as Madison said, in a single republic, in a single republic, that's what government looks like. But our government in Federalist 51, this it's a compound republic. And so Madison said, in a compound republic, the power surrendered by the people is first divided among two distinct governments. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other. Power surrenders divided among two governments and they control each other. It's a double security of the rights of the people. That's our government, but it doesn't stop there. Because this is the balance. Also in Federalist 45, he said, the powers delegated are few and defined. Those reserved to the states are numerous and indefinite. And he goes on to list what they are. And it's, everything is reserved to the states except matters that affect all the states and particularly on foreign affairs. That's what our government looks like. And so until we can put that picture in the minds of the, the leaders that we hire and inspire so they understand what game we're playing, they understand the rules and the fundamentals and the size and the shape of the football and the field, it's important. It's important. Otherwise, we're going to get what we're getting now because we've lost sight of those fundamentals. And because we lose sight of the fundamentals, this is what we get, right? <laughs> yeah, that looks a lot like, right? That looks like the policies that are happening all the time, right? And it's getting bigger and bigger and more voracious. So this is what uh, Thomas Jefferson said. He said, it must be done by the states themselves erecting such barriers at the constitutional line as cannot be surmounted. And then uh, John Adams said, if there be no such line between the powers of, the, at that time it was the colonies and the crown, if there be no such line, the consequence is that the, the, the states are either vassals of the national government or they are totally independent. If we can't decide what those spheres are, it's one or the other. You can't have both if you haven't identified a line. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And then James Wilson. James Wilson is the only man that signed the Declaration, signed the Constitution, and was an original member of the Supreme Court. This Constitution deserves praise for the accuracy with which the line is drawn between the powers of the general government and those of the particular states. The powers are as minutely enumerated and defined as was possible. They drew a line between the powers of the state and the federal government. That's critical, otherwise you get a centralized government occupying itself in all aspects of our daily life, 3,000 miles away, and you've got 528 people that aren't from Oregon that you can't elect or unelect, determining what happens when they don't know your geography, your geology, your industry, your culture. That's what's happening now. How much better to determine and balance those interests legitimate, genuine interests of, of environment and, and, and funding education and economy, how much better to balance those interests for Oregon than by Oregonians, right, instead of people you can't elect. That's where it goes otherwise. So, so where's the line, right? That's available. It's, it's critical that we understand these things. We talk about acting like it, going on offense. I love this. Hot Rod Huntley was the voice of the Utah Jazz for years and years and years. And he would get up and when he would speak, he would say, you know, he played college and professional with Wilt Chamberlain. He would say, you know, Wilt and I, we combined one night to score 52 points. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah. He's and you say, well, Rod, how many points did you score? He says, doesn't matter. <laughs> he said, no, Rod, really, Rod, how many points did you score? It doesn't matter. And if you press him, you say, Rod, how many points did you score? He said, well, I, I scored two points. <laughs> But it doesn't matter, does it? Nope. It doesn't matter. The whole system of our republic is we've got some Will Chamberlains that step up and they, they put their lives and their families and their careers on the line and they step up to something that is a thankless job that you you know you don't get paid very much. And, it, and they step up to be Will Chamberlain and our job is to feed them the ball. Right? And it doesn't matter. As long as you get that 52 points, it doesn't matter who scores two and who scores 50. Right. But our job is to hire and inspire those leaders. I'll tell you about this just quickly, okay? So, 
I think one of the most important dates in our history is November 20th, 1772. November 20th, 1772 was when Samuel Adams and James Otis, they finally convinced John Hancock. John Hancock thought they were too radical for them, for him. Right? I mean, John Hancock, he said, let me write it really big so the king won't have to pull out his glasses. John Hancock said they were too radical for him. What was happening was, of course, the king was beginning to encroach more and more and more and more. Adams and Otis and others were recognizing this and said, we've got to do something about this. And they went to Hancock. He says, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not good with that. I'm not, you know, you guys are out there. And finally they said, look, they, they, they had their committee in Boston, and they divided it into three. And they started out by deciding, they've had three committees. One was to decide, what are the rights of the colonists as men, as Christians, and as loyal British subjects? The second committee just looked at what are the infringements on our rights and what are the consequences if we do nothing. And the third committee said, okay, how do we unify? How do we come together? And they put that together in what was called the Boston Pamphlet and they took that to John Hancock and said, just read it. And he read it and he said, oh my gosh, this is really, this is exactly right. This is what we've got to do. They said, can you help us get it out? And John Hancock got on board. He was the richest man in, in Massachusetts, probably one of the richest men in America. And uh, he funded sending that out. They sent that out to the colonies, or no, rather, they sent it out to the cities all around, around Massachusetts. And they all started coming back with resolutions saying, yes, we agree, those are our rights, these are the consequences, we've got to band together. And they started forming resolutions. In fact, they would say, you forgot some of the, the consequences and the intrusions, you forgot some of our rights. And they started coming together, taking action, where they're voting on a resolution. Now you're learning at a much higher level. This is what started things moving together in what was called the Committees of Correspondence which led to their ability, I mean, if, guys, think about this for a second. Can you imagine July 4, 1776? Do you think they just got up that morning and said, hey, I'm feeling lucky today. What do you say we go poke the branch in the eye? <laughs> no, they had been building their organizations. Now, I hope as we're going, you're thinking about how this applies to me. They were forming committees that networked with each other and they were ready to act and move and work with one another so that by the time they got to 1776, they had this network of committees. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have email and cell phones. They didn't have cars. They could cover 120 miles in a couple hours. They didn't have any of that. Imagine what they would do with the technology and the tools we have today. I want to plant something for you right now, too. I should have done this at the beginning, but uh, as we get toward the end, I'm going to hand out a little 3 by 5 card. And I want you on that card to write down what impressed you the most about what you heard today. Just a sentence or two or a couple of words, whatever. But I want you to write down what impressed you the most. We got the little three by five cards over there, right? Okay, so we'll get those out as the day gets going. But write down what impressed you the most as we get going on this. So, so they build these committees, right? And they're all networked together. By the time they get to the Constitution, that was this organization that they had that became the fourth branch of government. You look at the Constitution, you go to the National Archives, you see Article 1, powers and rights of Congress. Article 2, powers and rights of President. Article 3, powers and rights of the courts. Article 4, powers and rights of the states. Article 5, that's how you amend it. Article 6, that's the... the, the, the Supremacy Clause and all prior acts, we can look at those, and, and the oath, and then Article 7 is the effective date, right? But you've got those four articles, Congress, President, Courts, States, and then you get to the detailed stuff of how do you amend it, and what do you do with the oath and whatnot. That's the four branches of government, not three. The four branches of government that we keep forgetting about, but that's, it's critical. It's critical, and we'll get into Article 4 quite a bit. But so leading in with this organization, when they introduced the Bill of Rights, James Madison introducing the Bill of Rights on the floor of Congress said, the state legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of the national government. And they'll be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power better than any power on earth can do because they are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. How important is it that the leaders we hire and inspire know these things? Right? We have, to, we have to know these things so that we're not playing government, not pandering to policy. We're focusing on principle. 
So we'll get back to how this applies to this here in just a second. But I, so I want to tell you this. Uh, what the heck? This is what my grandma's chickens looked like when I was a young man. And she sent me out to get the eggs. <laughs> and she sent me out. And they're just, I mean, I swear the chickens were 10 feet tall. <laughs> and you go out to get the eggs and, you know, it was just, it was just scary. We got chickens about, oh, three or four years ago. And it came time to get the eggs, and my wife sent me out. She said, honey, go get the eggs. <laughs> so I'm like putting on the armor, you know? And I'm going out, and I'm going out to get the eggs, and, and, and my chickens are like, dude, what? <laughs> this, this is what my chickens look like. <laughs> I actually, I literally went back to the store it was Cal Ranch. I went back to the Cal Ranch store where I got the chicken. I said, something's wrong with my chickens. And they're like, what? I said, they don't peck. I'm like, well, what's the problem? They don't peck. I said, when I grew up, these chickens, they would peck like crazy. I said, they don't peck. I said, oh, yeah, we bred that out of them. I think there's a lesson there. There right? is a lesson there. There is a lesson. Right? No resistance. So we've got to peck. We've got to pack, and we've got to continue packing, and we've got to keep the pressure on. We've got to be on offense. And I, if we have time throughout the day, there are so many examples of commissioners and state representatives going on offense, sheriffs and county attorneys going on offense. And it's changing the game. Slowly, but it's changing the game. Because we're not going to win playing defense. We're simply not going to win playing defense. <laughs> So this is what John Dickinson, prominent founder, probably forgotten today by, by most. John Dickinson said, it will be their own faults. Actually, let me back up. He said, the government of each state is and is to be sovereign and supreme in all matters that relate to each state only and subordinate fairly in those matters that relate to the whole. And it will be their own faults if the several states suffer the federal sovereignty to interfere in the things of their respective jurisdictions. It would be their own faults. So that's critical. Um, I'm just quick, I'm going to go through jurisdiction, then we've got to talk about the land stuff, because that really gets to the heart of things. Jurisdiction is a critical term. We need to know the terms that the Supreme Court told us, right? Independent, sovereign, supreme, jurisdiction. We've got to know those terms. Well, there's just no excuse to not know those terms. If you don't know them, they will be defined for you. And guess what? You're going to lose power and you're going to lose control over your life, your liberty, your property. We've got to know those terms. And we have to hire and inspire leaders that understand those terms. That understand what their rights, powers, authorities, jurisdiction are. 1950. 1950, there was a big VA hospital in, in a state. Big VA hospital, right? Federal enclave, right? This is Article 1, Section 8, Forts, Batteries, Arsenals, Dockyards, VA hospitals. is considered in that. They don't pay taxes. And the state said, well, if you don't pay taxes, we're not going to let your kids come to our school. <laughs> we're not going to do police and fire on that VA hospital. And in the Eisenhower administration, they got kind of worked up about that. So we got to figure out this whole jurisdiction thing. Because they're right, this is a federal enclave, but we can't be running schools all over the place. And so President Eisenhower and his cabinet ordered the U.S. Attorney General, who then got the Comptroller General. In fact, let me show you right here. The U.S. Attorney General, the Comptroller General, all of the state's attorneys general, 33 federal branches, and they studied a thousand different cases on the subject of legislative jurisdiction within the states, on federal areas within the states. Pretty important, right? Because they want to know who's the government. Who's the government on these federal areas within the states? Who governs? Right? That's what jurisdiction is. Who has the governing power? Who governs? So they did a 250-page volume, volume to the policymaker. They did another 250-page volume that is a legal brief, because they looked through a thousand different cases, right? They said, the committee noted there has never before been conducted a study of the subject of legislative jurisdiction approaching in comprehensiveness the survey of the facts, of law, facts and law in their report. You get the picture? This is a pretty important deal. There's, nothing, there's been nothing like this before or since to study who's the government on those federal areas within the states. Here's some of the things they found. Should be noted that the land's already under the proprietorship, we'll talk about that word, proprietor is an owner, right? They're just an owner. The proprietorship of the United States, um, such lands of the so-called public domain were not affected by the statutes. 
The legislative jurisdiction, the power to govern, with respect to those public lands, remained in the several states. The vast areas of land which constitute the federal public domain generally are held by the United States in a proprietorial statute only. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. So in this report, they identified four areas of authority. One was exclusive legislative jurisdiction. That's where the federal government is the government of the land it owns within the states. That's Article 1, Section 8, 17 of the Constitution. They buy it with the consent of the state, and it's a fort, it's a battery, it's an arsenal, it's other needful buildings. Did you get that? They buy it with the consent of the state. Right? With the consent of the state, then they're the exclusive government on those areas. That's the first one, exclusive legislative jurisdiction. The second one that they identified was what they called concurrent jurisdiction. That's where the state consents to share its jurisdiction with the federal government. You see how this is working? The consent of the state to share its jurisdiction. Because the general rule is the state has jurisdiction, the state is the government over everything within its boundary unless there's an exception. First exception is exclusive legislative, second is concurrent, the third is partial jurisdiction. That's again where the state agrees to give some part of its jurisdiction with the federal government. So those are the three areas where the state consents to give jurisdiction to the federal government. Then they identified a fourth area. The fourth area they, they call proprietorial interest only. That's scary there. Proprietorial interest only. And that's what, that's, here's what they call Proprietorial interest only. This term is applied to those instances where the federal government has acquired some right or title in an area in the state, but has not obtained any measure of the state's authority. Yeah. They're not the government. They own the land, but they're not the government. Yeah, we'll get to yeah. that. Exactly right. <laughs> you, see the, you see the importance? Yes, they own the land, but they're not the government in that area. Um, differing legal characteristics. This comes right out of that report, by the way. Right? By the way, this report is on the website, the American Lands Council website. If you go on there and just jurisdiction, you'll get all kinds of information on jurisdiction as well. As to the powers reserved by the state for exercise by itself, it's as though the United States had no jurisdiction whatsoever, i.e., it's a proprietorial interest only. The reserved powers may not be exercised by the federal government, but continue to be exercised by the states. Right? They just own the land. It gets even clearer. Where the federal government has no legislative jurisdiction, again, defining proprietorial interest, where the federal government has no legislative jurisdiction over its land, it holds such land in a proprietorial interest only and has the same rights in the land as does any other landowner. In the case where the United States acquires only a proprietorial interest, the state retains all the jurisdiction over the area it would have if a private individual rather than the United States owned the land. Mm. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had a land dispute and you brought in attack dogs and tasers and helicopters and gunships yeah. to deal with that land dispute with your neighbor? Yeah. Uh, that's the guy Bundy's. Right? <laughs> you see why this is important? Yep. Understanding jurisdiction is important. Now, never mind the, the issues of, I'm not, I don't want to get into the fees and the other things of why, but even if it's a fee, when you're coming in and you're a landowner, you're not the government on that land. It's critical. And this is the federal government's own report. Now, we're working in Utah. This was done in 1957. We're, we're, we're going to fund the study to bring this current, but, but the law hasn't changed, right? You don't change jurisdiction by a court opinion. That comes from the people. So critical stuff. I'm gonna. I think there's a couple more of these legislative jurisdiction. Um, the last group, the interest of the states. Uh, you get the idea. The department, the departments themselves, the Department of Interior, others said, "Oh, yeah, no, we just need proprietorial interest. We don't need legislative jurisdiction." Changes um, fast. Vast areas of land which constitute the federal domain. That you get the idea. Um, so then they also did a legal brief on this. Now, I'll tell you, they went after they did this report, they went to the General Services Administration, the GSA, they said, we need to document every acre of land within the states in these four categories. And so if you can search that. I don't know if I've got all the GSA reports on the website. We can put them on there. I've got them for Utah. In Utah, for example, they documented them into the four categories. 99% of all the federal areas in Utah 
proprietorial interest only. No jurisdiction. This is the federal government's own reports. Now these terms, they still use these terms today, proprietorial interest. They don't know what they mean. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know what they mean either. So it's critical that we understand what this is, right? That we hire and inspire leaders that understand jurisdiction, rights, powers, and authority. So that's the football, okay? We're starting there. There's so much more we can talk about. But that gives you some foundation in how critical this is. You see the power of that? If you understand that the federal government is not the government over the BLM and the Forest Service lands, they're the owner, like any other landowner by their own report, how different is that? <coughs> Sheriff, they're locking gates on you, right? How different is that if you say, no, 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 you're like any other landowner. You're not, you're not the government, right? So, so critical, critical stuff to, to work on. Now I want to shift gears and let's come back over here now. Let's talk about some specifics here. Get out of that. There we go. All right, now let's come back to this. So I want you to think about something for a second. Um, how many of you heard that, that oh, that IRB, man, what they're, they're talking about, that's just impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. It, 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 it's, does everybody have a card? Does everybody have one of these cards and one of these cards? Does everybody get one of those? No? Can we make sure we get these out to everybody? Get, you want to get one of each of these? Yeah. Okay, so we'll get those out to you. But, uh, does that look right? Let me, let me come back here. We'll, we'll, let's come back to here. Look at that. That's the West. Yep. That's not the Verizon map of their aspirations for the Western States. <laughs> they wish they had that much coverage in the Western States, right? If you think about it, I want you to, this is your, one of your homework assignments, so you take, you'll get these little cards, you take these little cards, and you, you just hold it up and you say, um, the red is the land controlled by the federal government. And if you don't ask the question, they're going to ask the question. What do you think it is? What? Why? Why? The difference. In fact, I was on the plane coming over with a woman from Medford, and she just, I was working on the, some of the power, she says, What's that map? What is that? And I said, well, the red is the federal government, the land controlled by the federal government. Well, why is that? That's exactly the question. Why is that? That's the question we need to be asking. And so when people come in and they very smugly say, well, that's just the way it is. And it would be impossible that you should be treated the same as the people over here. It's impossible that the children in Oregon should have the same opportunities for income tax revenue and economy that they have over here. It's impossible. Why? Oh, it's clearly unconstitutional. Why? Well, because you gave up the land. No, we didn't. Why? We're going to talk about those questions, right? They're yeah. pretty good questions, don't you think? Mm -hmm. So let's come back here <coughs> and start here, okay? Because our job is to hire and inspire leaders to battle for. So imagine you're a Jew on the streets of Germany in 1945, and someone comes up to you and they say, hey, be of good cheer, don't worry, within five years, you're going to be restored to your homeland and have your own nation. Huh? Impossible? It happened. It happened. Talk about impossible. That's impossible. It happened. So what about if somebody says, uh, well, you know what? Within five years, the President of the United States is going to be elected from a party that doesn't even exist today. Wow. And one of the two dominant parties is going to be gone in five years' time. Impossible? Nothing's impossible. It happened. <clears throat> it happened. Perilous times create powerful political possibility. 
That's the opportunity that we have. It's a wonderful time to be alive because people are going to be ready. People of good faith, without regard to party, are going to be ready for your invitation to say we need to hire and inspire leaders to have the knowledge and the courage to go battle for our children and our environment and our economy and not throw out these policies that are failed policies that fail. Imagine that, isn't that crazy? Failed policies fail. And you're seeing that all around you. We're seeing it all around the West particularly, but, but beyond. So here's, uh, here's where we're going to go, and this is, this is how simple this is. And we'll have it on the back of this card, and we'll go through this as we get toward the end. But here's, here's the whole story in, in 10 seconds. The promises that stayed here to transfer the land are the same, east and west. They're the same. I'll show you them in just a second. The promises are the same. It's already been done before. It's already been done before. A whole bunch of states were way worse off than Oregon. They were 90% federally controlled for decades, and they're not today. It's already been done. And it's the only solution big enough to fund education, grow the economy, care for the environment. And all it takes is knowledge and courage. See that? That's the whole thing. You got that right on the back of this card. I'm going to show you people are giving away thousands and tens of thousands of these cards. They're available on the website. You can print them off, do whatever you want with them. These cards are on the website as well, and you can print those off. People are printing these off and giving away thousands and thousands of these. In fact, well, I'll show you as we get, get going forward. So, uh, let's see if we can get this mic over here. Can we get this over here? I want to show you a little video. Just, just think about it for a second. Can you really have a one-size-fits-all environmental policy no. when the land and the landscape and the climate and the geography is so different? And you've got, you know, bless their hearts, you've got people on a two-year rotation from New Jersey <clears throat> trying to come tell you how to, how to manage your forests. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, they're doing the best they know how, most of them, yeah. right? But, but, I'll tell you a quick story. So, um, about three, four weeks ago, one of my dear, dear friends, is this working now? Yeah. Hey, how about that? <laughs> it has been. It has been, so I don't have to shout anymore. Sure. No, I'm losing my voice. If I just talk like this, you can hear me? Oh, nice. Okay. Calm down. You're like, what's that guy excited about? So, dear friend, Representative Galvez in the legislature with me passed away last year with kidney cancer. His wife, Lisa, was uh, going down to Bryce Canyon with her horses to go riding. And uh, she calls me up. I'm up in Salt Lake. She's a couple hundred miles away or better. She says, can I... My horses got lost. So I don't know what to do. What can I do? Can you think of anything to help me? And, and uh, so I thought for a minute, and I called the county commissioner, Daddy Garfield County. I said, Commissioner Pollock, you know, Lisa, she's down there. She needs help. Is there any way you can help her? She says, you know, I'm busy working with my dad, helping him. But, but you say they were at Ruby's Inn right outside Bryce Canyon. I said, uh-huh. She says, I know right where those horses are. He calls her up and he says, okay, go over here and look for your horses. And guess what? That's where the horses are. Because Commissioner Pollock grew up in Garfield County. He raised his kids in Garfield County. He's got a business in Garfield County. He knows every square mile of Garfield County. Who better to balance the interests and protect the interests of Utah than Utahns? Right? That's what we're talking about. That's how radical this is, right? Local control. Right? Yes, we need to balance environmental concerns. Yes, we need to balance protecting the land and access to the land. Yes, we also need to fund education and grow the economy. Who better to do that for Oregon than Oregonians? And not 528 members from Congress. It's our support. So you know, I think I can probably mic this right down here with this mic then, if this is working. I want you, I want you to see this little video. This is, uh, you should probably recognize this. Let's see here. Get on here. There we go. Okay, we can move the mic up if you like. Reality for tens of thousands of people in the world. 
Library. Many counties in the state have cut public safety budgets due to loss of vital timber movements. That's money from the federal government paid to counties with large national forests. In other words, land that can't be taxed. Josephine County, in the southwest corner of Oregon, was probably the hardest hit. The Sheriff's Department lost more than half of its funding. As a result, deputies no longer respond to emergency calls in the evening or on the weekends. Calls like this one, made just last August. I don't have anybody to send out there. Okay. Uh, it, you know, obviously, if he comes inside the residence oh, and assaults you, can you ask him to go away? Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. I've already asked him. I've already told him I'm here. He's going to be close up to the next door. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So, is there any way to safely leave the residence? you got to be kidding. I can't. He can do something like that on the way out. Well, the only thing I can do is give you some advice. <laughs> Call the sheriff's office tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh, jeez. Uh, coming in and unfortunately has a weapon or is trying to cause you physical harm. That's a different story. I, you know, the sheriff's office doesn't work up there. I don't have anybody to send. According to police records, a few minutes later, the woman's ex-boyfriend, Michael Bella, used a piece of metal to pry open her front door. He then attacked her. Eventually, state police arrested him, and he pleaded guilty to sexual assault and Oh, among other charges. He broke into her home and he raped her. A lot of the policing in this area was paid for by federal money uh, that helped subsidize the area because there's a lot of federal land there. So part of it is their main industry is timber. timber and we were subsidizing that, but they were subsidizing that in their federal land you can't tax because the government, the federal government owns the That's land. Right. So they instead subsidize this national state. That's Josephine County Sheriff Gil Gilbertson. He sent out a press release. In it, he warned victims of domestic violence to, quote, consider relocating to an area with adequate law enforcement services. There's absolutely no consequences to committing a crime, given the fact that law enforcement is as weak as it is. For years, we have said. Federal timber payments funded good public safety in this county. They also kept local tax rates low. People wanted really hard to say this should not happen. This is a They're close to home? Yeah. <laughs> I think it was closer. Right? So, so you had, and, and, now Sheriff, I heard this, and I'm not, you, you confirmed this for me. On your patch, do you actually have like logging something on your patch, right? The logging truck on the patch. Because that's what funded public safety and education. And then that was taken away because of some arbitrary federal policy. And then they said, we're just going to pay you to not use your land and your resources. <laughs> this is happening all over the West. We're going to pay you to not use your land and resources. And now, SRS, Sheriff just lost $6 million out of a $12, billion, $12 million budget. Yeah. It's gone. BLM, I mean, you've got, you got, you got built money, right? Payment in lieu of the taxes that you would otherwise collect if they had transferred the land. Right? Payment in lieu of taxes that you would collect if they had kept their promise. It's not just built, it's like, well, I don't even know the acronym for the rest of that. Payment in lieu of taxes you would collect if they kept their promise. That's what that is. Big lie. But that's coming back. What it really is, now I want you, I want you to know what PILT really is. You ready for this? What is it? PILT is pennies in lieu of trillions. <laughs> that's what that really is. But see, this is, this is harming real people right now. That's, those are the messages we've got to get out. Right? You're going to be Benjamin Franklin now on YouTube and Facebook. And, and Twitter and all of that, and get that out, and email, and carrier pigeon, whatever you can do. You've got to get these stories out. This is affecting real people, real jobs, real lives, and, and, and it's happening now. So I want you to look at this one just, just a second as well. This is a governor in Montana. This is a pretty liberal Democratic governor. This is at the Western Governors Association just last year, Governor Steve Bullock. So these videos are up on the American Lands Council website. Think of the opportunities to share these, to teach. We, we can message this from the middle to the middle. We can reach those people that are unaffiliated that need to know and need to get activated and, and start moving. There's, there's some of the, you know, eco-obstructionists, you're not going to reach them. 
right? I mean, their agenda is about control. It's not about the animals. It's not about the water. It's about control. We're not going to reach them. But the people that see the forest burning and the animals dying and the children being, you know, the schools being, being boarded up, we've got to reach those people. So here, check this out. This is Governor Steve Bullock. For those of us in the western states, you know, there's a real high degree of frustration when it comes to management of our federal forest lands. In Montana alone, the numbers are astounding. Since 2000, 6.3 million acres of Montana's forests have been affected by the Mountain Pine Beetle. 4.3 million acres of forest and rangelands have been impacted by wildfire. The urgency is so apparent. Our forests should provide multiple use. Managing our forests to accomplish and accommodate those various uses and benefits, it doesn't just happen. In Montana, I think we've done a relatively good job of doing that. We manage only 5% of the state's forests and lands to provide up to 15% of the annual timber volume sold in the state. And we do that while still protecting endangered species such as grizzly bear, bull trout, and lynx. On our federal lands, though, the story I don't think is quite the same. Wildlife habitat is degraded. Watersheds are at extreme risk, endangering key fisheries and clean water. Fire dangers off the charts, threatening local communities and stifling recreation. To say nothing to the economies of our rural communities. In Montana, we still have a viable wood products industry with small and large mills dotted across the state. Yet without significant changes in an available timber supply, we'll see more and more of those mills close. Yep. Interestingly enough, about six years ago, a diverse group of Montanans came together to try to figure out how we could address these problems. And after years of hard work, they came up with a plan that actually they could all support. But then they took the plan to Washington, D.C. And it was in Washington, D.C. that that group of folks that had all come together on the ground in Montana learned the hard truth. The Washington, D.C. wasn't really interested in finding solutions to these problems. Mm -hmm. Congress was too polarized to get anything done. They were told, yes, forest management's broken, but no thanks. We don't want to try anything. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, now that they believe that the Forest Service and the overall system is simply incapable of getting anything meaningful done on the ground. We now can't wait for the federal government, though, to figure out a solution. It's up to us as Westerners to really bring answers forward. Which brings me back to, I guess, my experience as a member of managing Montana's public lands. I think that that model works well because there's a clarity of purpose, first of all. Second, with five statewide elected officials managing these lands, there's direct accountability for decision making. A third factor involves attorney's fees. People who sue us have no ability to recover their fees. You see the power in that? This is not a matter of, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a partisan issue. There are those who will try to make it that. And there are those who, to, to protect their centralized control, will say that anyone that's even talking about this is somehow, you know, a, a Neanderthal and grabbing the pitchfork and whatever. But this is a very liberal Democratic governor from Montana saying, no, the, the wildlife is, 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 is harmed. The watersheds are degraded. Fire risk is off the charts. And the federal government is not interested in solutions. Yeah, we know it's broken. We don't want to try anything about it. That's right. Too polarized to get anything done. So think about that. The opportunity that we have is, in, is to get out of the left-right and get into the local versus centralized and change that whole paradigm and say, hey, brother, you know what? Time to work together. Let's solve these problems in Grants Pass. Let's solve these problems in Oregon. As hard as it may be, there's going to be challenges, right? But in Oregon, you've got to face the children that you're educating right there. You don't have the luxury of saying, we're going to print money until we can't. We've got to get things done on the ground. We've got to take care of sick people and poor people and roads and public safety, no matter what happens in Washington. It's time to start changing that conversation from getting people fighting against each other over an issue so that you can divide them and polarize them and control them all. That's a political dynamic as old as time. It's called the Hegelian dialectic. 
You get people fighting against each other, you can control them all. No, it's time to say, look, we've got to work together for our children in Oregon. Now, we may differ on how that's going to happen, but we at least have to make the decision here. And, and we've got to get together and we've got to take care of our environment. We may differ somewhat on how that's going to happen, but we can agree that we need to make that decision here. <clears throat> and we've got to take care of our economy and make sure people are working so that they have jobs and they can feed their children and take care of our sick and our poor and public safety. And we may differ on how that's going to happen, but we've got to make that decision here. You see the power in that? People are ready for that because they see that failed policies fail. And centralized policies fail more often than not. And <laughs> failed centralized policies always fail. <laughs> right? It, people are ready for this. How are we doing on time? I want to make sure that as we get to some of these things, that there's a couple things I want to make sure. If some of you have to go, I know some of our representatives and others may have to leave. Are you good on time for a little bit? Okay. I want to make sure we get some of these things through. What I want to do, just to give you a roadmap, I want to kind of walk through some of the history on how we got here. On, on the history of public lands, and then I want to look at your specific Enabling Act language in Oregon, and, and, and we'll look at some of the myths and the fallacies that are happening on this. Um, Ray, if we get to the point when we need to take a break, are we good to go? Are we good to go for a little bit? Do you guys need to stand up and stretch or whatever? Go for it. Go for it. Keep going. Go for it. Go for it. What's that? Yeah, why don't we take a break and then we'll come into this new section. We take, take, you know. Take, take five, we'll come back and we'll start on in a second. The intention of that was property. Um, this is what our, all of the state constitutions were life, liberty, property. Um, justice George Sutherland, he's our only U.S. Supreme Court justice from Utah. He said it this way, man has three great rights, life, liberty, property. They're so interconnected as to be a single right. Because if you give a man his life, but you take away his liberty, you take away all that makes life worth living. You give him his liberty, but you take away his property, which is the fruit and the badge of his liberty, you still leave him a slave. Property. Property is critical. Property is, is what, where we derive liberty from. I mean, liberty, it's all about liberty, and that's, that's the whole purpose of why we're here. Property is the essence of liberty. This is what John Kenneth Galbraith, world-renowned economist, said in the mid-'80s. He said, where socialized ownership of property is concerned. Only the USSR and China can claim company with the United States of America. In a land, in a nation developed upon and founded upon the principles of life, liberty, and property, only the USSR, now the Soviet Union, now, now the Russia, and China can claim company with the United States of America founded on those principles. Remember, we've got to get back to the fundamentals. This, this, the reason this seems so wrong to anybody that looks at that card is because it's an entire violation of our foundational principles of life, liberty, and property. Abraham Lincoln, right? Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Not of the bureaucracy, by the bureaucracy, for the bureaucracy. So let's get into to this, right? This has already been done before. It's already been done. So the people that say, oh, it's unconstitutional or it's impossible, guess what? You say, well... It's already been done. So see if this sounds familiar, okay? Federal government's not disposing of our land no. like it promised. We can't educate our kids because we can't tax the land. Can't grow our economy, create good paying jobs. Minerals are locked up. Does that sound familiar? Uh -huh. You see, that was uh, Illinois and Indiana and Missouri, and Louisiana, and Alabama, and Mississippi, and of course you know that great western state way over there, you see that western state over there of Florida? <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. Florida actually sent resolutions to Congress saying, we're the worst off of all the western states, <laughs> because you're not disposing of our land. They were as much as 90% federally controlled for decades. They're not 90% federally controlled today, right? No. What happened? Maybe we ought to know what they did, right? Yeah. This has already happened before. Their complaints were our complaints. We can't educate our kids. You're controlling our economy. We can't grow our economy. You're hoarding all of our lands. You're not keeping your promise. That were the exact complaints that they had resolution after resolution, delegation after delegation, petition after petition came from Illinois and Indiana and Missouri and Louisiana and Florida and whatnot, right? It's already been done. So, turns out it was 
one man, one leader who simply refused to take no for an answer. <coughs> he was a Democratic senator from Missouri. His name was Thomas Hart Benton. Any of you ever heard of the book or maybe read the book, Profiles in Courage? Oh, yeah. He's one of the half a dozen guys featured in that book by, John, by President Kennedy. Profiles in Courage. His courage was so legendary. But think about this. One man. He says, my election to the Senate of the United States found me doing battle for an ameliorated system of disposing of the public lands. <coughs> Not battling against anyone or anything. That's critical. Doing battle for changing this system of disposing of the public lands. He says, I resolved to move against that whole system. You see, refusing to take no for an answer, burning the bridge. No, this is principle-based. We're not taking no for an answer. He says, I ran a bill every year, but it was more so in the speeches to the public that had a bigger effect on the public mind. Because where's the power? People. People. Right? That's the power to hire and inspire leaders to battle for solutions big enough. Yeah, he ran a bill and taught his colleagues in Congress, but he went out like this to people all around the United States and taught and educated so that they would hire and inspire leaders. Now, it took him 25 years with no Facebook or, or cell phones or airplanes or even you know, trains mostly. That's some trains probably. But it took him 25 years. He didn't have anything near the technology that we have. But let's look at what else he had to say. He says, federal government was like a stepmother instead of a natural mother. They became a monopolizer of the vacant lands of the West. Who's he talking about? Vacant lands of the West. Illinois, and Missouri, and Louisiana, and Florida. They were a monopolizer of the vacant lands of the West. And like all monopolies, it resulted in a hardship. Does that sound familiar? Few or none of our public men were even talking about this before I came into the National Councils. They were probably saying, well, oh, that's impossible. The federal government controls the land. He says, my own voice was soon raised there against it. It's certain that a great amelioration, a great change has taken place. That the sentiment of Congress and that of the people generally has become much more liberal in land alienations. Because he understood that the power in our system is in the people to understand and have that knowledge to hire and inspire leaders. He says, but the members of Congress, and I would submit that the county commissioners and the state representatives and the county attorneys and the governors and the attorney generals and the members of Congress should fix their eyes steadily upon the period of the speedy extinction of the federal title to all the lands within their respective states. And Illinois is not 90% federally controlled today, and Missouri is not 90% federally controlled today, because one man with courage. 1854 is when they finally passed the bill. In 1854, they passed the Graduated Price Act that said we're going to reduce the price a quarter a year. Because Congress, Congress being in the real estate business, how great would that be, right? <laughs> Congress in the real estate business said every acre is a buck and a quarter. We don't care if it's down by the river or if it's sagebrush territory. Every acre is a dollar and a quarter. Of course, the good land sold immediately. The rest of it sat and sat and sat and sat. And 90% of Illinois, Missouri, and other states were federally controlled for decades. So the Graduated Price Act, they pressured and pushed, said they would reduce the price, reduce the price a quarter of a year, and then finally just give it to the states. That's the bill that they passed, right? So let's look at the history. By the way, that's also happening, and I think we'll look at this. I don't know if I've got the slides on there. 1959. I'm guessing there's one or two of you that were alive then. <laughs> I'm not going to point you out. 1959, Hawaii, because the federal government controlled Hawaii, they took the land away from the native Hawaiians, controlled it when they were coming towards statehood. The native Hawaiians, again, political pressure, refused to take no for an answer pushed on Congress, and they transferred all the land directly to the state of Hawaii. Their enabling act says this, we hereby grant directly to the state of Hawaii title to all the public lands, title which is held in the United States immediately prior to its admission. They granted it directly to the state. We'll show you some other things on that in a second. So why did the federal government ever hold any of these lands in the first place? Isn't that a good question? Before that even. Before that even. So you go back to 1763, the king in the colonial charters to the colonies granted to seven of the states 
claims over the western lands. Six of the states, just their colonial boundaries. Seven, granted their colonial boundaries plus the claims to the western lands. Got the picture? Any of you have like more than one child? Right? And you give one child something that you don't give the other child? Does that work out well? So think about that for a second. Seven have claims to the western lands, six don't. 1776, right? Lives, fortune, sacred honor. Off they go. By 1780, they're broke. Can you imagine? I mean, think about that for a second. You just picked a fight with the British, the world's most powerful, well-trained, well-equipped army in the world. And you're broke. And they're trying to figure out where we go, what do we do? And the six states are looking at this western land saying, hey, let's sell all that land and fund the war. And the seven are saying, wait a minute. We, those are our claims to the western lands. You go raise taxes for your share. We'll sell our claims to the western lands. See a problem here? It was such a big deal. They called it, they called it the, great, uh, the, the great embarrassment. They said it was the question of the age. That's how big this question was that started the public land question. It was the question of the age. And so the Continental Congress meeting together kept trying to persuade the seven to, to, to let them control those lands. At first they said, hey, just give us all the land. They said, wait a minute. We're fighting a war against the land baron. We're not going to create our own land baron here. Continental Congress came back again and said, okay, okay. Let's create this in, in, in the form of a trust arrangement. And they passed a resolution on October 10th of 1780. Anyone who's ever looked back on this issue points to this document as the start of the public lands question. Be it resolved that the unappropriated lands, which is what we still call them today, that may be ceded to the United States by the states. You see where this started? Land that may be ceded to the United States by the states shall be disposed of for the common benefit. That meant to pay the debt of the war. There's all kinds of other documents that reflect that. And shall be settled and formed into distinct Republican states with the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, and independence as all the other states. Two conditions on the trust. Pay the debt of the war, only create distinct Republican states. In fact, they even said when they did cede their land, no other use or purpose whatsoever. Now, they also said these lands shall be granted and settled under such regulations as Congress may prescribe. You see, the regulations are for disposing of the land, right? And the conditions on that are only to create new states, use the proceeds to pay the debt. On the basis of this resolution, New York ceded its lands to the collective United States. And in their deed of session, they said, only to create new states, only to pay the debt, and no other use or purpose whatsoever. Virginia ceded its land, same condition. No other use or purpose whatsoever. It's right in the deeds of session. They called these the compacts that they made, right? So, so the states began ceding their land, saying only to create new states, because look, we're going to use it to fund the war, but we don't want you to be a land bearer, and we don't want you to do anything else with it. Otherwise, we would just kept it. And so the states now have a claim on that land to pay for the war. The United States has a claim on that land. And by the way, they use these terms, claim. Keep, keep that word in mind. They have a claim on that land to pay the debt of the war. The states have a claim on it that they're not going to do anything but create states. They're not going to become a land baron, right? 1784. 1783, we win the war. Improbably, we win this war. Providentially, we win this war. And so they go to Thomas Jefferson and say, okay, you draft the land ordinance for this new nation. And Thomas Jefferson, who has a way with words, says, uh, so much of the territory ceded or to be ceded by the states to the United States, right? It's the states that created this deal for their own benefit. He says, in no case shall interfere with the primary disposal of the soil by the United States nor with ordinances and regulations. Kill me over there, man. <laughs> Don't interfere with the ordinances or regulations that Congress may find necessary for securing title in the soil to the bona fide purchaser, right? You see what's going on? In 1780, they created a trust. Now they said, okay. You new states that may be created out of that land, don't interfere with the job of the United States to dispose of it. Don't interfere with that. They're a trustee. Don't interfere with them doing their job, because guess why? The other states have a claim on that land to pay the debt. 
and to use to use the proceeds to pay the debt and to only create new states. Don't use state. We're going to make you a state, but don't interfere because that land is going to be used to pay the debt. Don't you interfere with that. Got the picture? That's how, and then Jefferson, for the first time, Jefferson coins the term equal footing. So when you're created as a state, that same rights of sovereignty, freedom, independence, as all the other states, he says equal footing. Because again, he has a way with words, he just shortens it right down like that. So now 1787, the Northwest Ordinance, that was described as the third most important document in the founding of our nation, the Declaration, Constitution, Northwest Ordinance. States will be admitted to share in the federal councils on an equal footing with all the other states. And those states shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil, because that's how we're going to pay for the war and make sure we don't have a land bear. Nor with any of the regulations that Congress finds necessary for securing title in the soil. You get the picture? You see how it's consistent here? Now we come to the document that gives Congress the power to do anything at all. Right? Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2 of the Constitution is the only provision in the Constitution that deals with this public land question. Now see what it says right here? Congress shall have the power to keep the land forever and ever and ever and ever. It doesn't say that, does it? No. It says Congress shall have the power to dispose of. Where did that language come from? Oh, back in 1780 when we formed this trust agreement. By the way, I'm going to show you some cases in a minute where the Supreme Court has repeatedly called that arrangement from 1780 a trust. Any lawyers in here? Wally? Trust, right? You create a trust agreement, and you got a trustee, and you got the beneficiaries. Who holds title to the property? The trustee. The trustee. Yeah. And it holds title in his name, right? Yes. And the yes. tax notices go to? Yes, the trustee. The trustee. Yes. Can the trustee sell the land and go book the cruise? No. Why not? He's holding it in trust. With He's holding it in trust to do what? Uh, to holding it in trust for the benefit of beneficiaries. Yeah, to do whatever that trust agreement said for the benefit of the beneficiaries. But the trustee holds title to the land. You get the picture? The Supreme Court has repeatedly called this a trust. In fact, at the time of our statehood, it said the federal government only holds territorial lands in trust for the states ultimately to be created. I'll show you some other things on that here in a second. So Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. Remember what the needful rules and regulations were for? From 1780 and 84 and 87? For disposing of the land. Make needful rules and regulations for disposing of the land. The DOJ, the Department of Justice today, you, well, let me, let me finish this last part and I'll come back to that. And nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of any particular states. I dare you to go ask a lawyer what that third subclause means. Be <laughs> I mean, seriously. Claims. What are the claims in the United States? What are the claims of the particular states? Well, you guys know more than that than anybody that's gone to law school in the last 20 years. Because you don't read this stuff. You don't go through this stuff in law school. The claims go back to 1780. The seven states had claims. They decided to consolidate their claims so they could fight the war. Because otherwise, we were dead at childbirth as a nation. And so we consolidated our claims, and the states had a claim to create new states. The United States had a claim on the land to pay the debt, and that was the United States' claim. The state's claim was, hey, don't interfere with that, because we're going to use that to pay the debt. We only agreed to you holding that land temporarily to make new states, not to be a land baron. Those were the claims. Now, let's check our math on this in just a second. But I want to say, the Department of Justice, here's how they read this. I, I sat in a 90-minute presentation, Department of Justice, to my sheriffs in Utah. Department of Justice takes that second provision that says make all needful rules and regulations and they say that means we can do whatever we want without limitation. That's how they read that. Now, rights we don't know are no better than rights we don't have. Rights we don't exercise are no better than rights we don't have. And if the Department of Justice and others come in and say needful rules and regulations mean we can do whatever we want without limitation and we don't know and we don't challenge that, well guess what? You're going to get what you get. Mm -hmm. Right? We've got to know this stuff. It's critical. So uh, let's check our work again. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm just doing my Jedi mind tricks on you and, and trying to fake you out. <laughs> oh, doggone it. I don't have it in here. Something happened to... Well, we'll, have to go, we'll go past it. I've got another slide that has the constitutional debate. In the constitutional debate on that section, you've got James Wilson. Remember, he's the original Supreme Court judge, signed the Declaration, signed the Constitution. 
You got Madison and you got Carroll talking about this section. What are we going to do about the territorial lands? What are we going to do about those western back lands, they called them? Wilson said, hey, let's just be silent on that litigated subject. Remember, that was the question of the age. The states already solved that. They already did their compacts on that. Let's just be silent on that. Madison said, okay, if we're going to be silent on it, let's make sure that we protect the claims of the states, that they don't interfere with the disposal of this land. And Carroll says, okay, let's draft it this way. Nothing in this Constitution shall be construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or of the states to the Western territories. That's what the original draft of that section is going to be. Governor Morris, who was the committee on style, the head of that, he got in and drafted it the way it was drafted today. That's the constitutional debate on that section. Don't interfere with the claims of the United States or of the states to the Western territories because they both have claim on that land because that's how they fund the war and that's how they're going forward and we're not going to keep, not going to have the federal government be a land bearer. Let's check our work some more. By 1830, remember? So you only hold the land to pay the debt, create new states. By 1830, the debt is paid off. It's the only time in our history we have no national debt. How would that be? <laughs> <laughs> right? No national debt. So Congress, Congress gets a bright idea, because that's what Congress does. They get bright ideas. And they say, hey, the debt is paid off. So we know we have to dispose of the land. That's what the Constitution says. That's what this whole thing says going back. We know we have to dispose of the land. In fact, they said it's the great national public trust. We know we have to dispose of the land, but since the debt's paid off, we'll just keep the money. And when the states do what we want, We'll give them some money. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, has been that way ever since. It passes the House, it passes the Senate, and it runs into President Andrew Jackson. And he says, no, you don't understand. You don't understand. We would not have become a nation but for the solemn compacts that were made with respect to that land. And he goes through the best history. It's on this thumb drive as well. That thing is on here. He goes through the most contemporaneous history. Let's think about this for a second. Andrew Jackson, born in 1767. By 1787, when the Constitution is drafted, he's 20 years old. He's not 20 years old by today's standards. No. You know, in the basement playing video games or whatever. Yeah. Right? He's already a lawyer. He's a lawyer by 1787. He practices in Tennessee. He spends all of his military career in Tennessee and New Orleans and the Western territories. He's living this stuff. And so by 1830, when he writes this, he's not just coming pull, pulling from the books, even though he cites books and chapter and verse. He lives this. Here's what he says about it. This is just part of it. It's the real interest of each and all the states of the Union, particularly the new states, that the price of these lands shall be reduced and graduated. And after they've been offered for a certain number of years, the refuse remaining unsold shall be abandoned to the states. And the machinery of our land system entirely withdrawn. What would that look like today? He says, it cannot be supposed, it cannot be supposed that the compacts, going back to 1780 and the deeds of session, intended that the United States should forever retain title of lands within the, sta within the states that are of no value. And it's no doubt entertained to the general interest, the interest of the whole nation, will be best promoted by surrendering such lands to the states. That's where this came from, right? That's 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 the that's part of the history. Now let's check our work some more. Maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe we're just getting lucky finding some of these documents. Let's see if there's anything else. Well, okay, this is the Congressional Public Lands Committee. So in Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas and Florida, they're 90% federally controlled. They're descending on Congress because they refuse to take no for an answer. And so they're having congressional hearings. This is the Congressional Public Lands Committee report. They said, if these lands are withheld from sale, which is the effect of the present system, right. in vain may the people of these states expect the advantages of well-settled neighborhoods so essential to the education of our youth. You see, we can't educate our kids because you're controlling our land. So these states will, for many generations, be retarded in their endeavors to increase their comfort and wealth because they have not the power incident to all sovereign states of taxing the soil. You see, if you're a sovereign state, you have the power to tax the soil. If you don't have the power to tax the soil, what are you? Subserving. I don't know, you're something other than a sovereign state because sovereign states have this power. That's what they're saying. When these states stipulated not to tax the lands until they were sold, 
they rested upon the implied engagement of Congress to cause them to be sold within a reasonable time. Mm -hmm. That's the question. While the first week of contract class in law school, right? First week of contract class. What's you need three reasonable? things for a contract, right? You need party, price, and subject matter. What happens if you don't have time? What's that? What happens if you don't have time in a contract? Time for duration of a contract? Yeah. yeah. Boy. Contract. Yeah. No, no, no performance. No, no, you just need party, price, and subject matter, right? If you don't have time, what do they what do they Offer impute? consideration acceptance is what I was yeah. looking Yeah, yeah, that, that, th those are the terms. But if you, yeah. you have, you have party price and subject matter, but you don't have time, you impute a reasonable time. Reasonable time. That's, that's implied in every contract. Now, in land, you're not going to put this in land because land, Illinois, is different than Oregon, and it's different than Arkansas, and it's different than Florida. So you don't say dispose of the land in 10 years. Or whatever. Or whenever, right? But but a trust, a, the whole idea of trust is the highest duty known in law, the utmost good faith and loyalty. It's the highest duty known in law, that trust obligation. So it was implied that they're going to dispose of the land in a reasonable time, because they understood these principles. No just equivalent has been given those states for a surrender of an attribute of sovereignty so important to their welfare and an equal standing with the other states. You see, we don't have the power to tax the soil, we're not equal with the other states. If we don't have the ta power to tax the soil, we've given up and we've lost an attribute of sovereignty. So we never gave that up. This implied engagement of Congress, look at Article 6, Clause 1. We don't have time to talk about that. There's more stuff on the website and videos. But implied engagement of Congress, Article 6, Clause 1 says, all engagements entered into before the Constitution are valid and binding after the Constitution. These are engagements entered into before the Constitution. So Missouri, right? Resolutions, all kinds of resolutions of the states back then saying, hey, you gotta keep your promise to us. But this is just the one of Missouri. Look at what Missouri says. Missouri says the system of disposing of the public lands of the United States now pursued is highly injurious in many respects to the states in which those lands lie. It's an infringement of the compact between the United States and these states. They said it Missouri never would have been never would have consented to this if it had been understood by the contracting parties that a system would be pursued which would prevent nine-tenths of those lands from ever becoming lands in, in the hands of persons where they might be taxed. Mm -hmm. So we never agreed that you never dispose, therefore we can never tax. We never would have done that. Mm -hmm. We never would have agreed to a system where you hold 90% of our land. Now what are you complaining about? You're only 53% <laughs> <laughs> federally awesome. control. But you didn't agree to that either. Utah didn't agree to that either. Neither did Montana, neither did Arizona, neither, neither did poor Nevada, that's 81% federally controlled. We didn't agree to that. Same, same exact situation. Utah, for example, by 1915, 1915 is less than 20 years from, from our statehood. Same folks are still around that were there in statehood. And they do a, they do a resolution to, to compel the federal government to dispose of the land. And they said, in harmony with the spirit and the letter of the land grants to the national government. Remember, we just talked about those, 1780 and the deeds of session. In spirit, in the harmony with the spirit and the letter of those land grants. You know, the spirit means, hey, that's what we meant to do. The letter, that's what really those documents mean. In harmony with the spirit and with what those documents actually mean, and in conformity with the terms of our enabling act, we call on you to, to return to the former liberal national attitude of disposing of the public domain, and we earnestly urge a policy that will afford us to settle our lands, use our resources on terms of equality to the benefit of the states and the strength of the nation, in conformity with the terms of our enabling act. By 1932, by 1932, you've got all the lower 48 our states now, Arizona, New Mexico in 1912. And they're starting to push, and hey, come on, you gotta transfer our lands. In the 1920s, they're starting to push. The states are banding together, just like Illinois, Missouri, and Arkansas, and those guys did. And they got to President Hoover. President Hoover convenes a commission for disposing of the public lands. That leads to congressional hearings. You see the title of the congressional hearings in 1932, right at the top? Granting remaining unreserved public lands to the states. And they hold congressional hearings on this. And in the congressional hearings, they say, okay, we've got to transfer the land to the states. Now, the reason you transfer the lands to the states instead of selling them to settlers at that point is because you've got so much time has gone by, the states have to sort out those interests. And so you transfer it to the states, you let the states sort out the grazing and mining and access and recreation and all the rest. They talked about all that back then. So, so they're running a bill to transfer the lands to the states. 
the agencies get involved. And the agencies say, okay, we've got to transfer the land. We know that's the trust. We know we've got to do that. We're just going to keep all the minerals. All the benefits of it. We're just going to keep all the minerals, right? And so, yeah, exactly right, all the benefits. Our governor, Democrat governor, George Dern from Utah at the time, working with all the other governors of the western states, said, well, we, we, we take it as a compliment that you think we're now grown up enough to manage this surface, but we, more wisely than the federal government, but we can't help but wonder why we're not grown up enough to manage the minerals as well. They said, if you give us just the surface and take out anything that's, everything that's worth anything at all, you'll leave us with just the skin of a squeezed lemon. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they rejected that deal. The states all banded together and they killed that bill because it was only half of a half promise. Yeah. Now, I actually had our former, fortunately former, U.S. Senator write an article saying, well, the states were offered the land at one point. I heard a BLM director once say something like the states were offered the land and they didn't want it. And so because they were offered it and they didn't want it, they could never have it again. Yeah. Oh, no. Seriously. He actually wrote an editorial on that. We came back, and by the way, it's on the thumb drive and on the website. We came back and, and educated them on the actual history. No, they were offered half of a half promise. And the states rejected that and said, no, you've got to keep the whole promise with our states. Now, after this was, this was uh, rejected, they still had to manage the land. And so as a stopgap, they passed the Taylor Grazing Act a year and a half later. Anybody know what came out of the Taylor Grazing Act? BLM. This is the organizing document that gave birth to the BLM. Look at the very first line. Actually, we're going to skip past this. More on the history. The incredible stuff. He talks about the public lands question. Federal government's only a trustee. Um, you know, now that the debt's paid off, they're entirely released from the pledge. Uh, they're free to receive the new and liberal destination, right speedy extinction, right? Um, more stuff there. This is, the, this is the first line of the Taylor Grazing Act. Look at this. I mean, I, I, I'm not making this stuff up, you guys. This is the first line of the Taylor Grazing Act. In order to promote the highest use of the public lands, pending its final disposal. That's why the BLM exists. Pending its final disposal. So, from even from 1776, Maryland was the first one to say, hey, we've got to put these lands in trust and use them to pay the war. From 1776 all the way to 1976, we knew that the federal government was duty-bound as a trustee to dispose of the land. But in 1976, rights we don't know are no better than rights we don't have, Congress passes a new policy. Never mind the Constitution, the Solemn Compacts, the Enabling Acts, the court cases. Congress passes a policy that said it's now our intention, we're just going to keep these lands, we're going to retain them in federal ownership. It's now our policy to just keep these lands in federal ownership. Never mind Constitution, never mind Enabling Acts, never mind Solemn Compacts, never mind court cases. It's our policy <coughs> to keep these lands in federal ownership. Anybody see a problem with that? Tyranny. Uh -oh. yeah, yeah. That's where we are, right? That's how we got here. That was 1976. Now, I know some of you were around then. That's 1976. Now, look, here's some of the, the, just some of the legal authority. Supreme Court has said that Enabling Acts are solemn compacts, bilateral agreements with enforceable rights and obligations on both sides. They've said that the federal government only holds these lands in trust for the several states ultimately to be created. They said once the United States has fully executed these trusts, the sovereignty of the new states will be complete. They and the original states will be on an equal footing. The United States never held any municipal sovereignty, jurisdiction, or right of soil except for temporary purposes to execute the trust. Get the picture? By the way, there's... Uh, well, now, fortunately, we'll just a couple, couple more slides and we break for lunch. Fortunately, this is what got us started on this. 2009, unanimous U.S. Supreme Court opinion. We don't have time to go into the details, but it's, it's about Hawaii. Remember Hawaii because they refused to take no for an answer? Right. Federal government transferred all the land to them at statehood. Native Hawaiians were still never happy that their land had been taken away. <coughs> By 1993, so Hawaii is a state in 1959. So 1993, Congress passes a, a, an apology resolution to the Native Hawaiians. They were, you know, their land was taken away and all the stuff, and it just still didn't work out well for them. They did an apology resolution in 1993. So what is that, like 34 some odd years after their statehood? Well, based on that apology resolution, right, 
the state of Hawaii goes to sell some of the land that it has that was granted to it it's in, an, in its enabling act, and the Native Hawaiians, based on this subsequent act of Congress, say, no, 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 that gave us a lien in that land. This subsequent act of Congress changed the deal of statehood unilaterally. That was their claim. District Court dismissed the claim. The Hawaiian Supreme Court upheld their claim. It goes to the United States Supreme Court. And here's what the United States Supreme Court says unanimously five years ago. The consequences of a state's admission are instantaneous. It ignores the uniquely sovereign character of that event to even suggest that somehow subsequent acts of Congress can diminish what was already bestowed. <laughs> <laughs> and that applies with even greater force where virtually all of the state's public lands are at stake. Right? So you see the power of that? Congress, and it makes sense. It makes sense. The law should make sense. It makes sense. Congress doesn't have the power to unilaterally change the deal of statehood. That solemn compact between sovereigns, particularly where the public lands are at stake. They don't have the power to change the deal, and yet that's exactly what Flipman purports to do unilaterally changed the deal. That's what opened the door for us to move forward on this. That's what got us starting investigating things. That's what got us starting looking at the bill. That's what led to the bill that I passed, the Transfer of Public Lands Act in 2012. That's what led to all this research and all the things that we began discovering. And as we started from 2009 and worked our way back to 1763, guess what? It's so consistent all the way through. All the way through. And so now you have people that haven't taken that journey that we've been on so far, and there's more to go, that haven't taken that journey that say, well, it's just crazy to think that you should be treated the same as these states in the East. Well, that's just crazy. Or it's just clearly unconstitutional to think that your children should be treated the same as children in Missouri. <laughs> right? The answers even get more silly from there, and we'll talk about those after lunch. You can have toothpicks or you can burn. Right? More trees equals more fuel equals more fire. So you can have toothpicks or houses, or you can burn it and burn up the animals. And by the way, over the last 10 years, 122 million, conservatively estimated, 122 million animals, vertebrate animals, burned. 122 million, right? We've got to use it. I'll show you the charts here in just a second. We've got to use these things, right? So we can use it and tend the garden, or we can burn it. 10 million acres a year burning. And, and then, now here's what's really coming out of that. Because when those burn, now the watershed and the habitat and the resource is gone for generations. I mean, you see areas and you see them here, they're not regenerating in our lifetime, probably not in our children's lifetime. If they come back at all the way they were, oftentimes they're coming back very different because it's just it's creating a whole different situation. Here's where we need to go, okay? All right, so we, we, we've gone to some of the history. It's already been done before. We talked about the fundamentals of, of, of jurisdiction and rights and, and authorities of the states, and we talked about some of that. We talked about how it's already been done before and why the federal government owned it in the first place, right? They own it as a trustee, right? They hold it in trust to dispose, create new states, use the proceeds to pay the debt. And now we're going to get to promises of the same, it's the only solution big enough, and what do we do about it, right? We're going to cover that in probably about 35, 40 minutes and then take your questions, okay? So we're going to move kind of quickly, but, but why the difference, okay? So that was the question you started with, why the difference? Now, this is a really funny question on why the difference. When we passed our bill, when I passed my bill, we had, we had the newspapers coming out and saying, oh, well, that's clearly unconstitutional. To think that, to think, to think that, you should look the same as the states east of Colorado. It's clearly unconstitutional. We had the law professor from University of Utah writing articles. Clearly unconstitutional to think you should be treated the same. And uh, just clearly unconstitutional, right? So I was invited a year ago today, a year ago this week, I was invited to be on a continuing legal education panel with this law professor. I was really excited because I wanted to know why is it clearly unconstitutional? And so, so we're invited, we got a room of, of lawyers, about like this, 120-some-odd lawyers or whatever. And uh, so the question is, you know, about the transfer of public lands, is it constitutional? He goes first. So he gets up, this is argument number one from the law professor that the newspapers have just been printing without question, this is clearly unconstitutional. He puts up a map like this, average annual precipitation in the lower 48. 
He says, you see how it's different in the West than it is in the East? You see that, man? You see that, right? It's different over there, right? You see that? Different in the West than it is in the East, right? Different? Therefore, the federal government keeps the land. Already <laughs> read. I, I wish I was kidding. I wish I was kidding. I've heard that argument over and over and over again from the political science professors at University of Utah, UNLV, others that I've been on the radio with. Political science professors say it a little bit differently. They say, because of the aridity, these federal lands are retained in the federal inventory. If your land is dry, federal government keeps it here, right? Now, now, anybody have a constitution on them here? Constitution. Would you please look up and read for us the arid clause of the Constitution? <laughs> the arid clause of the Constitution. Would you read that for us, please? <laughs> Wally's telling us it doesn't exist. Wally, you don't have the law professor edition of the Constitution, I'm guessing. I mean, guys, now, okay, so we, we're laughing, right? You know what's crazy? Not one of the lawyers in that in that room raised an eyebrow or chuckled at all. He believed it. And what's even funnier, or maybe sadder, is we've been accepting this argument without even asking the question why. Because all we've done is ask the question why, and say, no, I really want to know why. Why the difference? And the law professor and the newspapers and the others are telling us that our land is controlled. When you pin them down on the argument, their first argument, your land is arid. And I've heard that over and over and over again, right? Now, think about it. Silly argument, of course, right? But think about it on its face. Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Eric. Right? I mean, even on its face, that argument doesn't hold water. Right? So to speak. But that's argument number one. It gets way, 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 way better than that, okay? So your land is arid. I've actually heard them say your land is rugged, therefore the federal government keeps it wally. Rugged clause, you got that one? No, no rugged clause. I mean, guys, seriously. Kind of an attorney argument. These are the arguments. These are the arguments that they give as to why we, we completely disregard liberty, property, and self-governance. Your land is arid, right? We've got to be ready to challenge these things or keep getting what we're getting. The second argument is way better than that. Okay, you ready for this? This was argument number two. Our, our law professor says, I've looked at the Enabling Act. You guys know what an ena Enabling Act is, right? You get about 60,000 people in your territory. You, you decide you want to start getting ready to be a state. Congress passes legislation to create the conditions for your statehood. And they pass a legislation called an Enabling Act. And if you hold a constitutional convention and your constitution incorporates the term of that legislation, the president will declare you a state. That's what an enabling act is. It's like the contract of statehood, right? So he says, I looked at the enabling acts of all the western states. And this is where he blows it as well. He says, he says, and they all say, forever disclaim all right and title. What? Therefore, you gave up the land for the privilege of becoming a state. The founders of your state just didn't want the land. I guess they didn't understand property and self-governance back then. You know, who knew in 1859 that was important stuff? Right? Right. They, didn't, they, they, they just gave it up for the privilege of being a state. Now, he was totally wrong in that respect, because Oregon's Enabling Act does not say forever disclaim all right and title like Utah's and the other states don't do. Yours is different. I'll show you that in just a second. But that's what he says, right? The law professor. I've looked at all the Enabling Acts, and they all say forever disclaim all right and title. So he didn't look at all of them. And he didn't bother to look east, because we already looked at that, right? We'll, we'll look at that again. But so yours, your enabling act says, never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil, nor with regulations for securing time. Remember, we looked at that earlier, where that comes from. Now, what people will tell you is that this is your enabling act. You never interfere with the primary disposal means you gave it up. Don't interfere with the federal government. They own it. They can do whatever they want with it. You remember that language. That wasn't your enabling act. That language was the Northwest Ordinance. Yep. That was based on 1780 and 1784 land ordinances that said, don't interfere with the trust, don't interfere with the federal government disposing of that land to fulfill the trust that funds the Revolutionary War and only makes states, right? But that's the, so, so that's the Northwest Ordinance. Well, guess what? Never interfere with the primary disposal or with regulations for securing title. Well, that's also Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, and Guess what? They've got, remember Illinois was 90% federally controlled in Indiana? 1.1, 1.5, 1.1, 5.3. .1, they have that same language that people will tell you is the reason why Oregon should continue to look like this. And I'll show you that in just a second. 
CAC never interfere with the primary disposal of soil with regulations for securing title? Well, that's Kansas's enabling act. 0.6% public land. Now, now, mind you, they had a lot of public land at statehood. They just disposed of it all. Like Illinois was 90%. Okay, so here you go. Here's Oregon now. That the foregoing propositions herein before offered are on condition that the people of Oregon, this is your enabling act, right? Or your act of admission, rather, same, same idea. That the people of Oregon shall provide by ordinance irrevocable, without the consent of the United States, that said state shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil or with any regulations Congress may find necessary for securing title in said soil to bona fide purchasers. You see how different that is from the Northwest Ordinance? You see how different that is from Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin and Kansas? You see how different you are? You see why you should be 53% federally controlled? She's going, no. Come on, man. Come on. You don't see the difference? You don't see the difference there? Come on. You're supposed to be 53% control because you just gave that up for the privilege of being a state. Right. That's what you're going to hear, right? You're going to hear that that language means you gave up your land because the founders of Oregon didn't understand property and liberty and self-government. It's the exact same. Now, I'll show you some of the other language. So that's yours, right? 53% public land. This is, uh, this is actually from your enabling act right there. Uh, the Act of Congress admitting Oregon to a state. Oh, by the way, you're supposed to be admitted on an equal footing. Remember, we looked right. at that. Right. Equal footing started back in 1784. You have the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, independence. That was always done in the process of admitting new states. So I want to show you, this is what some of the others look like. Nevada's been in the news a lot lately, right? And they said, oh, well, Nevada's different. They gave up their land. And so that rancher and whomever else in Nevada, they gave up their land. They're different. I want you to, I want you to see how different Nevada is, because their enabling act was done three weeks apart from Nebraska. <coughs> Nevada's was first. Nebraska, three weeks later, they're enabling it. Now, look how different they are. You see that? Nebraska's on the left. They were, in fact, more than 30% back in 1864. But the people inhabiting this state do agree and declare they forever disclaim all right and title inappropriate public lands. Do you guys see the difference yet? No. Uh, well, let's look at the next one. Declaring that the state is admitted into the Union on an equal footing with the original states and then sections number 16 and 36 uh, for the support of the common schools. You see the difference? No. Oh, you don't. Okay. 5% um, of the proceeds of the sale of public lands which shall be sold shall be paid to the state for the support of the common schools. Oh, over here. It shall be paid to the state for public roads and digital. Oh, that makes all the difference right there. That makes all the difference in the world. Nevada doesn't get their land because they only get to do ditches. <laughs> and Nebraska does schools. Enabling acts word for word the same. The money is paid to the state for public purposes. But, but, but yet they say, oh, Nevada's different. They gave up their land because that forever disclaimed. The way that worked, remember the states back in 1780 said, we'll give you clean title to the land so you can sell it faster for more money to pay the war, create new states. Same thing for us. We forever disclaimed, or we said we'll never interfere with the primary disposal. So you, the trustee, have clean, clear title so you can dispose of the land faster and for more money. I want to talk about two concepts quickly. Does dispose mean the same as sell? Yep. Yep. Does it? Does it? Wally, is dispose and sell the same thing? No. Which one's broader? Dispose. Right? Dispose is this. Get rid of title. They also use the word extinguish title. In, in our enabling act, and then back here, you saw that back here, I'll show you. Oh, no, we'll go back here. Uh, well, actually, it's another. In Utah's enabling act, it says, forever disclaim all right and title until title thereto shall have been extinguished. So dispose and extinguish means get rid of title. A subset of that, a subset of that is sell. If you sell by the agreement, pay 5% of the proceeds to the state. That started from Ohio all the way through, including Oregon. If you sell, 5% of the proceeds go to the state. All of the ones except Nevada is to support the schools. 5% of the proceeds of the sale of public lands, which shall be sold, shall be paid to the state to support the schools. 